Hi, I'm Harvey Oyer, author of the Adventures of Charlie Pierce children's book series. Behind me is the Jupiter Lighthouse, one of the most iconic buildings in all of South Florida, and it was my family's home in the year 1872, 148 years ago. Join me as we take another adventure with Charlie, Tiger, and Lily. This time, it's the second book in my children's book series, The Last Egret. And it is a story about adventure in the Florida Everglades and tragedy and heartbreak and learning valuable life lessons. So will you and your family join us on another wonderful adventure with Charlie? Today we're going to talk about the second book in the Adventures of Charlie Pierce series. It's entitled The Last Egret. An egret is a bird. The back cover of the book has eight birds that are indigenous to Florida, and the star of this story is the white bird in the center. It's called a snowy egret. So this story occurred in real life uh, in the 1880s, and it started on High Paluxo Island, which is an island in the middle of what we today know as the Intercoastal Waterway. Back then, that didn't exist. It was just a giant freshwater lake called Lake Worth. And my family, the Pierce family, lived on High Paluxo Island. My family arrived here 148 years ago in the year 1872, and they homesteaded on High Paluxo Island, and it was my characters, Mama and Papa, who were my great-great-grandparents in real life, their son, Charlie, and their daughter, Lily. And in real life, Lily was my great-grandmother. Well, the story started when a stranger came by our house, and indeed it was rare to have a visitor back then because we lived in the middle of the American jungle. There were no other people here other than Seminole Indians. And one day a stranger came by our house. His name was John Samuelson, and he had a scruffy, overgrown beard, and he hadn't bathed or shaved in what seemed like weeks or months. But we did the hospitable thing. We invited this smelly, hairy stranger into our house for a meal. And at the conclusion of the meal, Papa asked Mr. Samuelson the obvious question. What brought you into the middle of the American jungle, into the middle of nowhere? And his answer was strange. It was a one-word answer. He responded with the word plumes. And Papa scratched his head and said, plumes, I I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. And he went on to explain what a plume is. And in fact, he reached into his jacket and he pulled out a folded up, creased up cover of a women's fashion magazine. And he uh, opened it on our dining room table and it showed high society ladies in New York and Paris and London wearing beautiful hats with beautiful bird feathers called plumes. And he went on to explain to my family something we didn't know because we lived in the middle of nowhere and we had no news, that the uh, fashion statement for women around the world dictated that they wanted to wear these colorful plumes in their hats. And what at first started with one feather quickly became two feathers and three feathers. And eventually ladies were wearing entire dead birds on their head, walking around the streets of New York City thinking this looked fashionable. But no one was really asking, where are these bird feathers coming from? And the few people that did ask, they were lied to. They were told that these were the molten feathers that naturally fall off of a bird, and some kind soul gathered them up off the ground and shipped them off to a hat factory. But kids, that wasn't the truth. The truth was they were killing birds, and they were killing birds by the millions, so ladies all around the world could wear these beautiful, colorful hats. And while birds were being killed everywhere in the world, most of them were being killed here in our backyard in South Florida, an area that we today know as the Florida Everglades. Now that term had not yet been created. It was still known by its Seminole name, Pei Heoki, which in the Seminole or Miccosukee language means uh, grassy water. That's a good description of the Everglades, isn't it? Uh, it, if you've ever seen the Everglades, it's water with a lot of sawgrass on it. By the way, if that name sounds familiar, Pei Heoki, we actually have a city in Palm Beach County called Pahokee that takes the same name. So anyway, this guy Samuelson, who came by our house, had been out in Pei Heoki in the Everglades hunting birds, and he told my family that he was going to take all these feathers up north, sell them for a lot of money, and get rich. 
well, you can imagine Charlie, a teenage boy, listening to this story thinking, wow, we hunt every day as a way of life. We hunt for our breakfast, our lunch, our dinner. We have birds all the way around us, and now this guy Samuelson tells us we can get rich doing it. This is too good to be true. So as soon as Samuelson left our house, Charlie looked at Papa and he said, Papa, we're going to go hunt these plume birds, aren't we? We're going to get rich. And much to Charlie's surprise, Papa said, no, son, we're not going to do that. That's the wrong thing to do. We're not going to kill God's beautiful creatures just for money. Well, kids, that didn't sit too well with Charlie. He did what I think a lot of teenage kids would do during that era, is he decided to run away from home and go on a trip that he called the Great Plume Bird Expedition. And it was a trip with his buddies, his friends. They were going to run away from home, go on a big adventure and get rich doing it. And it wasn't too hard to convince his friends to do it. He had his childhood friend, Tiger Bowlegs, the Seminole Indian, but he had two other friends that uh, were not in my previous stories because they had just moved here. They were early pioneer settlers in the area that is today Lantana. Their names were Guy and Louis Bradley. You might have heard of their father, E.R. Bradley. He was a well-known man in local history, and he was one of the legendary barefoot mailmen. Well, Guy and Louie were our closest neighbors. They lived right across the lake. We were on High Pluxo Island. They were in Lantana, about where the old Key Lime House is located today. So this was not easy. Their parents couldn't find out about it. They had to have enough ammunition, guns, supplies, food, a boat, and sneak away from home. And they did. It took weeks of planning, but one day before dawn, all of them snuck away from home, and they sailed down the Atlantic coast to an area that is today Broward County. Broward County and Palm Beach County didn't exist back then, but they sailed into the Hillsborough River in what is today Lighthouse Point in Broward County. And they dropped the anchor and they patted themselves on the back. After all, they did a great job. They got away uh, scot-free from home. They didn't get caught. They didn't ground their sailing vessel on a sandbar or a reef. So it was a great start to the trip. That is until they opened the hatch on the cabin. And who pops out but Charlie's little sister, my great-grandmother, Lily. How awful is this? You're a teenage boy, you run away on a big adventure with all your friends, and your little sister now has come along for the ride. So how did she get here? Well, she had overheard the boys talking about the trip, and she wanted to go so badly, but she knew the boys would never let her go. So she did the next best thing. She stowed away on the boat. Well, here's Charlie, he's stuck with his sister, he's furious, but what is he going to do? If he turns around and takes her back home, they'll all be caught, so they're stuck with her. So that's how you get all five kids, Guy and Louie Bradley, Charlie, Tiger, and Lily, all on the Great Plume Bird Expedition. Now, this expedition was dangerous. It was in a wind-powered sailing vessel. They didn't have a motorized boat. They didn't have maps of Florida. They were determined to go deep into Peyoke and find these plume birds, especially the snowy egret, because the snowy egret feathers were worth the most. By the way, all the bird feathers had some value, but the most valuable was the snowy egret. Google this. An ounce of snowy egret feathers traded for three times the value of an ounce of gold in the late 1800s. So they were very valuable. Ideally, that was the bird they were in search of. So they started their hunting expedition. Uh, in what is today Broward County, up and down the Cypress Creek, uh, which was an actual waterway. In fact, when you go down I-95 today, you pass Cypress Creek Boulevard. That's named after the creek that they started their hunting. Well, at first, they, when they started firing their, their guns, all the birds would get scared away. So they got smart about it, and they started using hand and arm signals. So they weren't using their voices to scare the birds. And they would encircle a rookery, and a rookery is where the birds were. And by the way, a rookery was where you wanted to find plume birds, because rookeries are where all of the migratory birds come at one time of the year in the winter to breed. So you have them all in one place at one time, but it's also when they grow their largest, most colorful plumage because they're trying to attract a mate during the mating season. So you sort of have a two for one. You have them all in one place at one time and they have their largest, most colorful plumage. So we would encircle these rookeries and begin firing. And no matter which way the birds flew, they would fly into someone's field of fire. 
And after the first day, they killed several hundred birds. They didn't find any snowy egrets, but they found other varieties of egrets, herons, ospreys, eagles, cormorants. It didn't really matter. They killed any bird that they saw. And it was this first day as Charlie was smiling ear to ear, uh, separating the feathers from the bird carcass. And this was a very important process. It took time and you had to be delicate because if he damaged the feathers, they would be worthless. And so they would very uh, gingerly separate them. Then they would soak them in a lime solution so that the, it wouldn't decompose, and they would pack them in boxes. And they would just throw the bird carcass off to the side. And after a while, they had a large pile of bird carcasses. And this is when Tiger, Charlie's friend, started to look sad. And Charlie said, what's wrong, my friend? We had a great start to this trip. Look at all the birds that we killed. We've made a lot of money today. And that's when Tiger looked at his best friend, Charlie, and said, Charlie, I don't know if we're doing the right thing. Because, you know, in my culture, we only harvest as much from Mother Earth as we can use. And we're wasting all these birds. I think we're doing the wrong thing. And kids, it was in that moment that Charlie realized that he put his best friend in a terrible predicament. He put him between the excitement and the peer pressure of going on the trip, but also on the other side, what his cultural beliefs were in not killing and taking from Mother Nature things we didn't need. And I tell you this story for a reason, because one by one, all five children in this story in real life eventually decide that what they were doing was wrong and they all one by one decide to come home and stop killing birds. And Tiger was the first. The second was my great grandmother, Lily. And that's because Lily was a great lover of mother nature. She loved animals and she didn't like seeing all these birds killed. And then they discovered something they had never thought of when they dreamt up this trip. By the very nature of killing adult birds in a rookery during mating season, that means that you're leaving in the nest up in the treetop uh, baby birds without parents and those baby birds die or they are unhatched eggs and they're left there to die. So you're not killing one generation of birds so some lady that you've never met in another city can wear a hat. You are killing two generations of birds so some lady in another city can wear a hat. So one by one they decided what they were doing was wrong. It took a long time. It actually took five weeks in real life. In real life they virtually circumnavigated Florida. They went down south and they went deep into the Everglades from the bottom from Florida Bay, an area that is today Everglades National Park. And one by one they decided what they were doing was wrong. They eventually came home. By the way, they met the punishment of their lives. They had all run away from home. Their parents were scared. They were furious, but they all made it home safely. Can you imagine five teenage kids in a sailboat going around Florida for five weeks? That would never happen today, but that's how we lived back then. Well, the most interesting part of this story to me, kids, is not the big adventure that they went on. It's what happened afterwards. When they arrived home and after their punishment, from the parents. The bigger punishment was how they punished themselves for the rest of their lives. Because with the benefit of hindsight, looking back as the years passed, they realized what they did, kids. They engaged in the worst man-made environmental disaster in our country's history. They had been a part of it. Over a period of about 20 years, this bird killing happened over and over again, and millions of birds were killed. Some species of birds went entirely extinct. That means they don't exist any longer. And many other species of birds were almost made extinct, all out of greed, not out of need. It was purely out of greed. And all five of these kids decided they would never kill a bird again. And all of them would spend part of their adult life trying to go back and fix what they had done as teenagers because they felt so badly about it. And the one that affected the most was our friend Guy Bradley. And Guy Bradley waited a few years until he reached adulthood, and then he moved back down to what is today Everglades National Park. Back then it was just called Cape Sable, in particular a location at Cape Sable called Flamingo. And he spent the remainder of his life there as a game warden trying to protect birds in the very location that he had killed them by the thousands with my family just a few years earlier. So he devoted his life to saving birds after that. And kids, I wish this had a happy ending, but it did not. 
in real life in July of 1905, Guy Bradley was shot through the throat and murdered by a plume bird poacher that he was attempting to arrest. And his murder changed the world forever because it was the headline of every newspaper in America and Western Europe. And for the first time in 20 years, ladies read the paper and said, wait a second, I've been lied to all these years. The feathers in my hat are not the molten feathers that naturally fell to the ground. In fact, they're killing birds so I can wear this hat. And now they're killing people so I can wear this hat. You know what, I don't need to wear a hat that badly. And they started taking their hats off and they drove the industry out of business. But that wasn't the end. America was so outraged that our friend and neighbor, Guy Bradley, this innocent man, had been murdered trying to save these beautiful creatures that they demanded that our United States Congress do something about it. And so our United States Congress started passing laws to protect birds. And they passed a law called the Federal Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It's the same federal law that still protects our birds today. But that wasn't the end. Our president at the time felt the same pressure that Congress did. His voters, America, wanted him to do something to save these birds. But our president had a problem. Our president was named Teddy Roosevelt. And if you know anything about Teddy Roosevelt, he was one of our greatest presidents. His is one of the four faces on Mount Rushmore. If you've seen the movie Night at the Museum, he's the guy riding around the museum on the horse. He's a very famous president. Well, he exercised an authority that he has under the U.S. Constitution called executive order authority that allows the president, with one stroke of his pen, to do something without anyone else's permission. And he did. He created America's first national wildlife refuge. Today, there's over 550 national wildlife refuges in America, but the very first one, and it still exists, is in Florida. It's in Vero Beach. It's called Pelican Island, and it's a bird rookery. And he created that as a refuge for the birds after Guy Bradley was murdered. And kids, it was so popular. He started getting fan mail from voters around the country. Great job, Mr. President, do some more. So you know what he did? He created the National Park Service, Yellowstone National Park. He goes down in history as the greatest environmentalist to ever sit in the White House. But one of the key moments that changed him from being a big game hunter to one of the greatest environmentalists in American history was Guy Bradley's murder. But that's still not the end, if you can believe it. Some years earlier, some very thoughtful ladies, they created a club in Boston, Massachusetts, and they told their friends, stop buying hats, they're killing birds. Their friends didn't listen. Their friends wanted to look fashionable, so they kept buying hats anyway until Guy Bradley was murdered. Not only did ladies stop buying hats, they started joining the club, and that club was called the Audubon Society. And the Audubon Society, after Guy Bradley was murdered, grew into one of the largest environmental organizations in the world. Google this. The Audubon Society gives away an award every year. It's called the Guy Bradley Award, named after our friend and neighbor. So think about this. Because my Uncle Charlie had some harebrained idea to get rich and run away from home on a big adventure with his buddies, it literally changed American history because our friend Guy Bradley was talked into going on the trip with Charlie. And because Charlie talked him into it, it changed the trajectory of his life, eventually causing him to be murdered. And he died for something he believed in, and it radically changed the world. Isn't that an incredible story? And it's a true story, but it had a good outcome in the end. Today, our birds are protected, and our Florida Everglades and our environment is protected. Thank you for joining me on another big adventure with Charlie, Tiger, and Lily. I hope that you and your family enjoyed learning more about Florida's history and environment and the place that you call home. I'm gonna say goodbye for now from the Jupiter Lighthouse, the most iconic building in Palm Beach County, but extend to you an invitation. You and your family should come to the Jupiter Lighthouse, the oldest building in our county. It looks exactly the same today as it did 160 years ago. I hope you come enjoy our unique, diverse history. Thank you for joining me.